It's a Wonderful Life isn't a hit at the box office in 1946, but decades later, it becomes a Christmas classic. Our segment is not just the backstory of the Frank Capra film, it's a number of backstories and everything from sets to props and more. Perhaps you're one of those people who has watched it many times, but after this interview, you may never see it the same way again. It's a Wonderful Life is a wonderful story that has it all. Romance, good versus evil, the American dream, friendship. I think the secret to this movie is that it's a roller coaster ride of emotions. George saved his brother's life that day. Capra seems to make a point of every time he has to address our more serious subject, he follows it with a comedic and lighthearted topic. To me, it's a metaphor for life. There's much about the film you might miss. It has a, a 1940s and holiday flair to it. Michael Willen is a fan and author of The Essential It's a Wonderful Life. It's always been an opportunity to breathe new life into the film so people can share it on a deeper level. He meets us at the Davis Theater in Chicago's Lincoln Square. He inspects the foreground and the background to explain the moments or mementos that will make this classic film seem new again. While the movie opens in 1946, its backstory dates three years earlier. In 1943, Civil War historian Philip Van Doren Stern finishes writing a short story called The Greatest Gift, but can't find a publisher, so he comes up with a unique idea. He had a great idea one day and for a short story and followed through on it and actually decided to, to distribute it uh, in a unique way uh, to his friends and, and co-workers and acquaintances uh, in the form of a greeting card. It was essentially a pamphlet um, of this short story. Pass there, Captain Cook. Where are you hidden? Got to see Papa, really? Some other time, George. 200 Christmas cards, and one gets noticed by a movie executive who buys the rights for, in today's money, $175,000. Frank Capra directs Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. It wasn't a big hit at the box office, so why or how did it become so prevalent? You're right about it not being a big hit, and, and a little bit of it was marketing. They just weren't sure what this film was exactly. Good afternoon, Mr. Bailey. Hello, Violet. Decades later, the copyright lapses. And that's when it essentially entered the public domain, and uh, TV stations started showing it over and over again, and it started to become part of the fabric of our holiday experiences. I love watching this film in, in black and white, and that was Capra's original intent, mm -hmm. artistically, um, but I also enjoy seeing it, the colorized version. Hope you have a good trip, George. Uncle Billy and I are gonna miss you. You've seen the action up close, but instead of the foreground, this time we'll look at elements of the background and anecdotes from the cast and crew. Genuine English cowhide, combination lock, fitted up with brushes, oh, combs. No, no. This is a wonderful scene. This is actually on a back lot in Encino, California. I don't want one for one night. I want something for a thousand on one night. With plenty of room here for labels from Italy and Baghdad, Samarkand, Kurt Bixer. Samarkand nice. is in Uzbekistan. It's actually north uh, of Afghanistan. It was known as the Rome of the East and was on the Silk Road. It does make sense that a faraway place like Samarkand has caught his eye. I've been nominated for membership in the National Geographic Society. George is an explorer, right? And he's reading National Geographic. So totally understandable that George would want to go there. Up. Those not tapped by the judges will remain on the floor. Let's go! Brilliantly selected by Capra. It's actually a place called the Swim Gym. It still exists today, and it's at the Beverly Hills High School. And in 1940, they came up with this idea to save space, to put 
the, the gym floor over the pool. It's a one taker. Like there's no way you're going back and doing this again. Yeah. So they had to get it right. The predicament that Capra was in, he didn't want to have to try to right. try to recreate this a second time with yeah. people jumping in the water. The other thing is that the, the kids got paid an extra fifty dollars if they were willing to jump in the water. <laughs> and so in today's dollars, that's, that's seven hundred bucks. Wow. The ultimate goal here is to win the Charleston contest. We never figure out who actually wins the trophy in this scene, right? But we're gonna see later on that the Charleston trophy actually ends up in the building and loan office, George's office during the bank run scene. You can see it on a cabinet. So that is telling us in a very obscure way that they actually won the Charleston contest. This record here that Mary puts on for Buffalo Gals, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, Arthur Black and, a, and his orchestra, that's got to, you know, I'm just curious. Well, it turns out it's actually an inside joke. <laughs> Arthur Black is the assistant director and, <laughs> and was Capra's right-hand man for many of his great films. Not a thing. I, I just came in to get war. He's making violent love to me, Mother. You tell him to go right back home, and don't you leave the house either. Sam Weaver. Now give us some perspective on that. That seems pretty R-rated for the 1940s. Yeah, but in fact it was actually G-rated, because back in the day that phrase had a connotation simply of, of flirting. Even up into, you know, through the 60s, you can go back and look at movies and they'll use that phrase in, in the context of, of flirting. You notice something after they get married. What did you notice? Yes, yeah, so George actually isn't wearing a wedding band. Bert, the cop sent this over. He said to float away to Happy Land on the bubbles. Oh, look at this. When this scene was set in 1932, it really became popular during World War II and coming out of World War II. It was more of a European tradition mm -hmm. that caught on with American servicemen. toy soldier. He's playing a drum. It's actually a wind-up toy. Japanese toy made in the 1930s and it makes sense that she would have a toy on her bedstand. You know, I always think of this toy as kind of looking over her, you know, watching over her, making, taking care of her. But what's funny is the actor, kids on the set, like they would play with these toys. You can see that he has There's the drum. a drum that goes with it and it, it sticks into his waistband. I can... Does he work? And he does work. Look at that. After all these years. Where so, did you find this? I just got lucky. Sometimes you you know you do your research and you stumble upon it and it, it's it's a match for sure. It's not the actual prop, but it is yeah. a match to what's on Zuzu's nightstand. And so it's fun to think about her playing with this toy. <laughs> Inexplicably, in the closing scene, Mr. Welch is at the Bailey home as friends donate money to the family. The most surprising person who is there is Mr. Welch. Bailey? Mr. Welch, of course, punches George out in martinis. So he's not in our, our good graces, but here he is at the end of the film. Capra, at this point, was so pressed to cut time out of this film that he had to make some decisions. And the net effect is Mr. Welch is prominently placed in this scene, but with no context. Right. Well, that <laughs> helps explain why he was there. Carry on, Mr. Banford in New York. Oh, I left right in the middle of it. As soon as I got Mary's telegram. Good idea, Ernie. A toast <laughs> to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. <laughs> What is it that people discovered watching it decades later that they enjoyed that audiences didn't enjoy years earlier? I think it's at the heart of it is the messaging, right? I mean, the, the messaging rings true to us. The value of our life and, and the importance of reminding ourselves on a yearly basis, and the holidays is the perfect time to do that, of the 
a positive impact that we have on each other's lives. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. That's right. That's right. And a boy, Clarence. Once again, Michael Willen's book is The Essential, It's a Wonderful Life.